Welcome back, everybody. Today we're starting chapter 32, which in Hebrew is Lamed base, which is Lave, which is the heart. And this is the heart of the entire book, the holy book that we're learning. This captures the, it basically starts in chapter 10 and now is the completion of that understanding. Well, actually, we're going to summarize next week, but this is the higher unity. The higher unity, the mitzvah of the oneness of God to connect everything to God's oneness, which comes from the verse, Hear, O Israel, the Lord is our God, the Lord is one. So what exactly do we need to do with this commandment? We need to connect everything to God's oneness. Well, there's two parts to that. There's the higher oneness and the lower oneness. The higher oneness is showing how the emotions of God don't really add to the oneness of God. It's all, it's still all oneness. It's still all the oneness of God. So this chapter is chapter 32, which is the heart, is the life, is the heart. So what happens in the heart of the world of Atsilas, the world, the world of divinity, connects directly to God's essence. It's not an addition. And we're going to use the metaphor of a human being that what's in a person's lungs right before they speak, the feelings that they have in their lungs connects directly to the essence of what they want. Even though it has to go through so many stages before it gets about to be spoken, the spoken word, the emotions directly connect to the essence of the human. So too, what God is about to say and what he says, that's what makes the reality because we are all words, words of God. We are all like inside the, like inside a brain that's thinking words. So thinking those words creates, like in imagination creates a world. So that's where we're being created by God's Speaking, speaking inside himself. We're all words of God. Everything is words of God. So the, 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 the idea of the higher oneness is before God even speaks, the emotions that are going to motivate that speech are connected directly to the essence and oneness of God, and they don't add to, or take away or change God in any, in any way at all. They connect to his essence. So we're really learning the heart of this commandment in this chapter. So let's start reading inside. While we're waiting to open up the chapter, I just want to uh, say something really interesting. Um, you know, from, from the military armies, we can learn how to be an army of God, how to serve God how to make ourselves better. So I heard from a, a colonel that studied this is that the, his conclusion was from, from analyzing the data that the difficulty in mental health that we've experienced um, in uh, uh, this, this last century, and especially in the latest times, is directly connected with electricity. Well, how so? Because people before electricity, they didn't have so many um, mental health issues. They, they, because they had sleep. Because there wasn't much to do after the sun goes down. It was very uncomfortable to have, to, you know, to read by the, the, those candlelights. So people just used to go to sleep and wake up at dawn or before dawn. And that gave the restoration necessary to the brain. So most difficult challenges are the brain will actually figure out a way to deal with them itself if it is given sleep. And this kernel proved that that uh, battle, uh, post-traumatic stress disorder and psychological battle problems happened um, by in wars where the soldiers were not able to sleep. And in fact, 98% of the soldiers 
became psychologically damaged if they had a constant war that continued, constant battle that continued for weeks on end. And when in battles where the soldiers were able to sleep, the brain corrected itself and the person didn't have psychological problems. So that's so important to understand that God created us, created us in a way that we do self-correct and we do fix ourselves up. We just need to have the emotional fortitude to take that step and turn off the turn off that computer, turn off for that 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 cell phone, turn off the electricity, and get your sleep and get up early. And a lot of problems, stress problems, will correct by themselves. It's so simple. Okay, so Rabbi Smith, can we uh, uh, take up, um, look at chapter 32? Sure, thank you, Shana. And I just want to mention, I heard that uh, quoted in the name of Thomas Edison, who is credited with uh, inventing the mass-produced light bulb, that uh, he said now they could get rid of this useless thing called sleep because people would have electricity all night and they would not need to sleep anymore. So it's interesting, He, if that's true, and I have, I don't know firsthand, but um, that uh, kind of a, a, a dismissiveness to, to sleep was actually part of the mass invention of the mass produced light bulb. Well, it's true, people stopped sleeping, right. but th th to correlate that directly with the mental health, um, and and prove and pr prove it. This this uh, this colonel proved it from right. from battle experience and battle research. Uh, it's pretty amazing because that that gives a lot of hope to people that all they need to do is to correct that. That's the first thing they need to do is correct their sleep. And the most protective thing you could do for the stressful times that we're living in now of uncertainty is turn off the 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 computer, turn off the electricity, and go to sleep and wake up early. Right, turn off that phone. Turn off that phone. If your person just would limit their reading of WhatsApp to one hour a day, their life would be much easier. And also teaches us compassion on people who are who are experiencing the mental health effects of sleep deprivation is to be compassionate on them because they're they're just having a natural outcome of the the sleep deprivation. And if we just get them a a little a little vacation in a quiet place with uh, the curtains closed, a few days of rest could uh, make a big difference in every person's life. Without even therapy, just right. natural God created people that they're going to correct by themselves. Right, right, exactly. Beautiful, beautiful. We should create a sleep uh, sleep pod, you know, something like that. You know, people would just go, they could sleep, check out, no, no noise, no phones, nothing, no kids to to uh, um, keep them awake. And now that's really, by the way, postpartum depression is uh, mostly sleep deprivation also. Because in the old days, in the old days, women had a mother around, a grandmother, a sister, multiple sisters, cousins, nieces to take care of the baby. There was no such thing as not being able to take a nap. There was people around that lived in these family units. The whole town was one or two, three, four families. And uh, now, unfortunately, people are so isolated. They don't have any relatives nearby. They don't have a mother. They don't have a grandparents. They don't have sisters, cousins, nieces, and everyone's operating on their own. And, and uh, I think that that's one of the you know, great things that we need to take on in terms of the things that we've talked about that need to be properly addressed, that rebunum need to properly address is rebunum are acting in a reactive way. So someone comes with a question, they're going out of their mind, what should they do? The answer is the rebunum need to see that they need to establish organizations that they come in the middle of the day, they take the girls out of school instead of this insane drive to try to replicate the mass production schooling system of the, the secular world. The girls in the afternoon should be at home helping the mothers, letting them rest. If, if the girls should for who um, should be going to young mothers who don't have any older girls to come home and help and just to give them two, three hours in the afternoon to rest. And that would stabilize the issues in, in mental health issues and would stabilize the issues in postpartum depression. It would, it would rejuvenate people's families the health of the family, the marriage, the children. We would do it just from a simple, simple readjustment of priorities. 
Right, just to do things what used to work in previous times because you actually don't have a record of um, mental health problems, so many from, from before electricity. And in fact, the first hospital for mental health was created during the, uh, during the, uh, the war of 18, um, you know, 62, 63 in the United States. That's the first time they needed mental health for the soldiers. Oh, this, in the Civil War, you mean? The Civil War, yeah. Mm -hmm. And um, but in the Civil War, that was the first time that they that they they also had nonstop. They started to have nonstop battles. Mm -hmm. hmm. Wow. So so insightful, and uh, that's something urgently we need to implement. We need to make a yeah. Right. So it's something that's unnecessary. It's something that people don't need to need to have. They just what? need to go back to to certain behaviors that worked for humanity for thousands of years. You know, it's just so interesting that you're saying that because uh, on the Muna Faith and Action Share that uh, we had this afternoon, um, on the RabbiSmith.org. So we had a, this Muna class. So one of the person, people I was talking about, Menuchas and Nefesh, Serenity of the Soul, and I was reading from the. Um, from Chavis Lavavis, Duties of the Heart, where he says that a person who has betochen, who has trust in God Almighty, is exempt from servitude to the king, exempt from the king's laws, and exempt from the uh, subjugation of his uh, other people. And um, so I was pointing out that if you have betochen, then the governor can put in whatever mandates he wants in place, and they have no, they don't apply to the man who has faith in God. That it's not that he's, he doesn't have to fight against the mandates. He doesn't have to resist the mandates. They don't apply to him in the first place. So someone raised the question. Well, okay, that's, that's uh, thank you very much, Rabbi. But what about if there's going to be this uh, cyber, cyber war attack on the United States and it's going to turn off all the past power? You know what, like implying and raising the, the what's that's, that, that's a real threat. That's a real issue, you know, like not wearing a mask. Okay, big deal. But what about if all the power goes out? So I suggested, listen, why don't you think about what that means if we don't have power? Number one is we're going to have no television and the, we're going to, the, the control over people's minds will be dissipated. In fact, I told them, I said, I don't even think that there's really a real threat of cyber warfare except for intimidation tactics, but no real sh shut off. You know why? Because if they shut off the electricity, they wouldn't be able to control people's minds anymore. Everyone would be sitting around, they get together with their neighbors, they have a conversation. People would connect with each other. They come out of their houses in the daytime and they wouldn't be traveling long distances because there's no, would be no fuel because the, all the oil gas pumps run on electricity. People will be figuring out different ways to work. They'd, they'd figure out different ways to make uh, income and make produce food. And we return to a very, very uh, much simpler life, be much greater calm and, and productivity actually. And um, so, so what are we afraid of? In fact, people would sleep because it wouldn't make sense to stay up. There's no electricity. The right. People would, the mental health problems would go away. Now, mentally, they could deal with each other because they're sleeping enough. Now, they just need to figure out how to, how, to, how to put boats down the river to bring supplies. That's it. That's right. And I pointed out the contrast between the 1970s. There was a uh, power outage in New York City, and there was a baby boom nine months later. And when everyone was forced to stay home from coronavirus, this COVID uh, tyranny, then uh, it was the opposite. There was actually a drop in the birth rate, significant drop in births. So what was the difference? The difference was that in the first instance, in the 1970s, when electricity went out, there was no television. So the lights were out, no television. What do people do they, when they're not busy watching what some pers deranged person in some uh, movie studio came up with to try to poison people's minds with, then they have uh, natural thoughts of affection and love and, and bring children into the world. If you leave people at home and they're forced to watch the terrible news, constant warfare against their minds and constant um, psychological distress of the announcements and they had all those numbers in the bottom, the number of cases going up and up and up and up and the number of deaths and the cumulative, they did a cumulative, so there was no rest. 
there was never a rest. There could have been no deaths for a week. And then they say, but the cumulative death rate is the number of deaths is this going back for a year and a half already. It was, it was an insane psychological warfare to drain people. And the end result is people do not have the ability to be loving and affectionate in those circumstances. They, they're just exhausted and, and strained and stretched to a point of, um, are really just going into a place of, of you know, withdrawal from, from intimacy. So that's, that's unfortunately the, what happened. And um, now it, we just, it supports what we're talking about over here, that the, this use of electricity is actually really, really detrimental. And um, if you go to Amish communities, it's really a, a remarkable. You see, in the, especially in like the summer, in the you know, fall and late summer and the fall and when the sun, the days are getting shorter, seven o'clock at night, every light in the house is dark. People are sleeping because they don't have electricity. They have just, they have these little gas uh, lamps. Maybe you see one lamp in the living room. Maybe someone's reading a book or a Bible or some of that. And then they're off to bed and go to sleep. And it's a blessed life. And they have much less uh, people are wondering why do they have the much better um, statistics of mental health? Right. That's the simple answer. They don't have electricity. They, wait, they don't have electricity. Okay. They're sleeping and they're not, they're not exposed to the mental distress that was being pushed on us. Now, even if people had mental stress, if uh, they would sleep enough, that this colonel was saying, even if this person has stress, they go into battle. But if they have time to rest, the body will still uh, recalibrate itself, even under stress. But right. if the soldier doesn't have a chance between battle and battle to rest, then 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 ninety eight percent will eventually uh, psychologically break down. That's right. I, I suggest that the enemies of peace are the ones writing a lot of these news stories about the coming doomsday and the coming collapse and the coming starvation, the coming inflation and the coming uh, cyber power. That who's going to sit and write those articles? The Soviets, the Soviet intelligence services, we're going to write those just to keep everyone completely in the state of distress. That's the they go wear down America. You know, if you read Sun Tzu's The Art of War, which I, I'm just uh, uh, re -re reading now in preparation for a presentation I'm making, um, he says, he says so. I mean, the the, the he says that the chokma of the of of a, this the wisdom that this non-Jew had. He says over here. Supreme excellence consists in breaking the enemy's resistance without fighting. If you could get people exhausted, if you could get people to be worn out from the emotional tiredness and the physical tiredness, they're, they're, not, they're not able to fight. They can't even see. Their eyes are blurred. They can't see where the enemy is. They're scared of the radiation here. They're scared of the air over here. They're scared of the guy over there in the white coat. They're scared of the government. They're scared of the troops that they imagine are coming in all kinds of different directions. They're totally left God should save us without even firing a shot. The people are in such a state of disarray, disarray and, and disassemblement from basic discipline, they're not competent to, they have no resistance. Right. So the best thing, if, if you were a Soviet general or a Chinese general and you said, how can, how can you defeat the United States? You put in the newspaper, Chinese army coming in, but you wouldn't say they're coming in five minutes. You say they're coming in six weeks. The Chinese army is going to invade. They're moving troops. They're going to move their the Navy to the United States coast. And the Soviets are going to invade this. And then everyone would be like six weeks of mental stress. By the time they would march in, everyone would be lying on the ground, like just totally, uh, you know, jelly. That's how they could defeat the people by telling everyone what they're going to do. They're able to, to break the resistance. That's that's the the that's the, the the strategy of deception that people don't even understand how they're being wound up tighter and tighter and tighter to the point that they no longer can function with basic common sense. And and you and you, you know, I see that we get these you know reports. This ingredient in this and that thing, and you start reading this stuff, and you realize. The person who's spreading this is spreading false so just to confuse people because it's so obviously false. You don't even need a scientific background to see that this is false information meant to drive everyone's adrenaline, cortisol, and, and, and make people stay awake, worried, unable to sleep. That's what they're doing now with the war. 
the alleged war and that they're, they're manufacturing in, in Europe, trying to just keep people in a constant state of distress, displace people, move people around, keep people on their toes. That's, that's the psychological warfare. Just the exhausting of people is a tactical move, regardless of which way they're moving. It doesn't matter. It just matters that people are being worn down. So it's very interesting because I, I looked up from the morale from Prague. It says that what, is, what do people need to do to avoid Hevel and Mashiach? Not to be da- you know, not to be damaged by the birth pangs of Mashiach, which way, which which we uh, apparently are experiencing now. So he says something very interesting is that what's the problem is we're going through a transformation, a shinui, a change. Shinui's changes are not good, and if you look, the day which 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 the word toiv good is missing is on uh, the second day of the week. Which is Yom Hasheni. Yom Hasheni, Sheni is like Shinoi, like change, the day of change. Mm. And good is there. So, what do we need to do to avoid this? Is we need to connect with not change, but with Taiv, because Taiv is missing. Good. It says, what are the two things that are Taiv? Being Isaac and Taira, being busy in Taira. And being busy in gemilas chasadim, kindness to others. That means lending people, giving people food, uh, visiting sick people, helping, giving a helping hand. So, because if we're going to connect our mind to things that are taiv, that are good, the study of Torah and the study and the, the, the acts of kindness, then we are we are basically mentally going above the changes. We're like ignoring the changes. That are happening, right? And just connecting and, those things. So right, it's, it's, a, it's basically a psychological uh, pain. The the birth of Mashiach, we can avoid it. We can, yeah, it's so beautiful what you're saying, and that's why the war of the public health war was against Camilla's Chosadim. No visiting the elderly, no visiting the sick, no visiting family members, no kibud ava aim, no hachnasus orchim, no bringing it, no honoring your mother and father, no gathering, bringing in the the. Um, no bringing in guests for Shabbos. No bringing in guests for the Passover Seder. That was the war. The war was to break the acts of kindness and to break the Torah study. They closed down the yeshivas. They, they made war on these two things because that they want to bring the Jews into the Hevle Mashiach. They want to bring Jews into the, the chaos and, and the trauma. And, you know, one of the things that the people lose sight of in all of this and i have a theory and i i have no way to prove this but i'll I'll, gonna float a a theory over here when you meet holocaust survivors you have holocaust survivors that are very upbeat joyous people rebuilt families joyful families happy families they themselves lost their entire families in the war and maybe they were kids or they were young teenagers and they rebuilt everything sometimes they were older people lost their family rebuilt their family and they they have a joyous um joyous families you have other people that came out of the holocaust very very bitter very angry and and they went through they went through hell and they went through terrible things and i'm not in any way judging them but my theory is that the people who came out joyous went in joyous they came from happy warm bright families loving families joyous families and what happened was there was there was like a major windstorm that was knocked over, destroyed, and but that's what they related back to, and that's the way they modeled their lives afterwards. Other people, I believe that there were people who did, not everyone had a rosy life, happy life. People, not everyone was on the right emotional uh, gradient at the time before the war either. People were, they could be religious, but they were not necessarily happy, joyous people, and that was already ingrained. So why would someone want to go back to that? Meaning to say it was bad enough. What, the, what was before the war wasn't necessarily a happy environment, a joyous labor dick place. And then it was destroyed. And now they're going to just go after whatever the current things. Now, that's only a theory. I have no way to prove that. But what I, what I use that for is to say to people now, what's your main priority? Your main priority is prove who it's bringing more children into the world. That's your obligation. And the obligation is carried out not only in having your own children, but you have to make sure your children marry and have children. So the most important thing is to show them a happy family 
that is going to become menuchas and nefesh, that they're going to aspire for that. It's not about the details of the mitzvahs as much as it is the experience of the warmth of the home, that then they're going to say, you know what, I want to go out and endure all the trials and tribulations of marriage and child raising because I see and I want to emulate what's really possible. And that, therefore, a person learns when they have that perspective, then you could be mevater on anything. Because there's no, when you're going to confront a situation in your family and you see people are not conducting themselves properly. Yes, do I have a responsibility to guide them in the right direction? Yes, it's my responsibility. Clearly, the Abishter asked Avraham, why is your wife conducting herself this way? True, it's my responsibility. But what's the end goal over here? The end goal is to create generations and generations of people that are going to be so happy to run, to get married and bring more children into the world. So therefore, we have to say, okay, how am I going to speak to the person about this? How am I going to guide them in this in the right direction? How am I going to create a warm, loving environment that, that will the warmth and love will not be lost in the dikduk, in the exactitude of the performance of what the right thing to do is? Then you're creating an environment. So I say to people, like people come and argue, you know, let's say husband and wife are arguing, sometimes they argue over the vaccine. So they're afraid, one is afraid that they're going to, you know, maybe there's a risk to uh, childbirth for the, ch- you know, if the, ch- the teenager is going to take it. So I say to them, listen, there's a greater risk that your children will not get married and have children from seeing your conflict than there is from the vaccine itself. The, for sure, we know that conflict and, a, and a, a, a conflicted family environment is going to bring stress for the children that they're not, they're, they're going to be resistant to get married. So that's your first priority. The, the, once you create family harmony, and, and I, I, what I've discovered is all the people that are calling about the stress husband against wife, there's, I always find out, I, I push a little bit and find out that it's actually been longstanding issues. It's coming to a head with the vaccine. So I said, listen, the vaccine is not an issue. It's not the issue. You need to work on what's the underlying creating a beautiful, warm house. That's where the danger is from the outside influences. And what exactly happens with the vaccine? You should state your position lovingly. But at the end of the day, that pales in comparison to creating a loving, warm environment that your children will want to replicate and emulate. And that's where we got to get people on track. Right, right. And and especially also that that really we found out that uh, it was two diseases. It was a regular um, flu together with a allergic reaction. So what's an allergic reaction is the immune system is not calm. It's, 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 it's reacting to the spike protein, whatever it is, and it, it, it's overreacting because it's an allergic reaction. But what really, what helped? Well, Benadryl helped, you know, um, things that help out, but some people just calm down and that stopped the allergic reaction. So if people take in this, this injection, which, which is going to be spike protein, it's like a, it's like a allergy, temporary allergy therapy. So what's going to help um, the body not to have this bad reaction to the spike protein? Well, being calm. So a person's internal state can really, really help how this, uh, this is going to affect the body. Right. That's yeah. That's very important. Absolutely important. Be calm, and then you see how they spread stuff. They spread to disturb anyone from any angle. So, guy didn't take the vaccine, but he's worried about the guy next to him who took the vaccine. He's walking around in an attitude of fear and feeling invaded because the guy next door, the guy who's sitting across from him, is allegedly going to send things into the air that are going to affect him. Who's this? Who's sick over here? The person is sick because he's thinking that there's things in the air that are floating around and now he's made himself sick. No, even if there are, if he stays calm, his body shouldn't react to them. Like, right. right. Like, like I'm, I'm saying, I have, I know you have, there's too much pollen over here in New York and you start reacting. So, but if you calm down, if you breathe slowly, calm down, even I, right. that I'm sensitive to pollen, I start being able to have, I get a clear nose because right. I calm down. I physically make myself breathe slowly, calm down, and my reaction is less to the pollen in the air. There right. you go. There you go. Absolutely. So that, person, that's what we need to teach you. That's the real secret to health. Right. A person's internal state, a person's sleep, 
that's how they're going to react to these uh, to these allergens. Yes. That's what we need to, that's why we have to connect everyone to the Ibishtah, to Hashem, because to God Almighty, because that's the answer to all the problems. Meaning to say, it gives you the strength to turn off the phone. You start with Shabbos. Oh, then that's, yeah. You yeah, start with Shabbos. At least you have one seventh of the week is disconnected. And then if you can expand from there until you're disconnected from this constant trauma machine called the cell phone, you know, people are so particular. You have all these people that are natural health people. I, I'm not, I, I mean, they, they, they're naturally, they, they would worry about what the ingredients are and where the origin of the, the genetic, possibly genetically modified ingredient from 2000 generations of oats or whatever it is ago, um, or 200 generations, whatever it is. And I say, one second, hold on a second you're so careful about what you ingest and what's in the air and you got air purifiers running in your house and yet you are releasing into your body massive quantities on a consistent chronic basis of cortisols and adrenaline from your thinking about all the dangerous things that are going on in the world. So what's the real danger over here? It's not the genetically modified ingredient it, 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 or organism. Whether the danger is not that pales in comparison. Again, it pales in comparison to what a person is doing to himself with his own thinking. He's sending into overdrive these production centers that create these emergency response systems that the Abish to God Almighty put into us for use in emergencies. And then our thinking creates 24 hours or maybe 16 hour or 17 hour a day emergencies. Well, what is the result of that? The result of that. If that's direct ingestion into our bodies and bathing every single cell in our body with these things that are not meant to be swimming around in us 24 hours a day. So let's start there. And we can, you know, that's the first priority. That's that overrides everything else. Yep, yep. It says in the Gemara that how, how a person could be safe from the war of Gog, Gog and Mogi. He says, eat three meals on Shabbos. Right? Our custom is the third meal doesn't need to be washing. It could be just tasting certain foods. But but eat three. So we see the idea of, of, of being restful and enjoying and appreciating what we have. Right. That's beautiful. And, and the Tzemach Sedek in his response to a plague um in the early 1800s he said one of his instructions to a community that wrote about how to, res how to respond to a plague was to eat past shachers to have a full bread uh and a filling meal in the morning meaning that's you start your day you have to stop to eat past shachers you have to stop you have to sit down you have to wash you have to eat the meal you have to bench we're talking about a minimum of 15 minutes dedicated to the eating process and then if you're going to, now you've got bread, you got to start cooking something and you can't, you know, what are you going to have on it? Just butter. You got to, you know, it's a whole, it's a whole experience. So it's not just that it's good to strengthen your body with the food. It's I mean, you're bringing out the time aspect. Right. To slow down. So we have a lot of practical things. We haven't even started learning, but we've discussed a lot of very simple practical steps that people can take to make a big change in their lives. Yes, that's what we're going to call it for the title of this uh, shear. So um, let, let's get the message out there. This is, you know, what we're teaching here with the Shariqo, the gate of oneness is the, the getting our thinking straight. And, and, and then we need to figure out ways to encourage people. I mean, I would love to, to sit together with other Rabbanim and say, okay, we have to get the girls available to their mothers. It's insane. Uh, Rabbi Shimon, it's insane the situation today. Think about it. The girls are in school from 8 or 8.30 in the morning till 5.30 or 6 at night. They come home, then they have um, homework. It's a lot of places, schools, like girls are up to 1 or 2 in the morning and they're doing play practice and this thing and that thing and schoolwork and, and they're not available to their mothers. They're not available to help their families. They're not available to take care of their own health and own restfulness. They're learning terrible, terrible sleep deprivation patterns for the rest of their lives. And it's all considered okay just because the name Base Yaakov is on it 
or base Rivka. It's got a Jewish right. name on it. It's not, like, it's, not, it's not a Jewish lifestyle. To be able to have strength, to be able to do something at home, productive, a person, you know, they shouldn't be working. It's like basically a seven hour work day, whatever they have. Four hours is max. Then you still have strength to do other things. Right. It's well, to go and learn and to meet other people. But afterwards, you don't have any, they, they don't, they, they are exhausted. They can't do anything at home anymore. Because they're right. exhausted. Right. Abolish the homework, abolish the, the long days. Well, and, homework should be abolished. Absolutely. It's, it's long days and they, and you can't really work on the basic building blocks of life. That's exactly right. And you see what happens is kids come out, they graduate high school, they graduate seminary, yeshiva, they have no experience in any practice, most, a lot of them have no experience in any practical skill in life. They can't change a tire, they can't cook an egg, they can't make baked bread, they can't sew, they can't do any of these things because they were so busy with this secular, secular uh, adop adoption, adopting the secular standard of information acquisition. That's a secular idea. Torah does not believe in ac information acquisition. Believes in connecting with Hashem. Connecting with Hashem is connecting with the giver of the Torah. Like you said before, we have to connect with Torah. And Gemilas Chasadim, you need to be both learning and taking Gemilas Chasadim is taking care of yourself, helping your mother, helping your father, helping your siblings, helping your father do the lawn, helping your mother do the laundry, do the sewing, all these kind of things, giving her a nap, all this, doing the shopping, that's Gemilas Chasadim. And, and then you could extend from there to help other families. But that is the way it's supposed to look. Right, right. And um, yeah, clean food. I mean, basic building blocks of food that have worked for thousands of years. People were strong and healthy. It's only when they had famines, that's when they got, you know, sicknesses. But otherwise, if they had clean air and clean food and good food, they had enough of it. Well, of the basic foods, which which were, in other words, foods that were foods 120 years ago, oils that were oils 120 years ago, that is food that should work today. But if it's something that was invented or, or made available after 120 years ago, we have to limit it. Oh, you can have it, you know, have it here and there, but limit, that shouldn't be the staple. Right, right. People were not eating bagels and... Uh... <laughs> these kind of things that, that uh, you know 120 years ago uh they weren't eating chocolate cake to the same degree and they weren't eating all this stuff and, and i have no problem like i agree with you 100 percent. we Let's, can have those things well, just we, we loved I, I love ice cream and i love i love chocolate but it's 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 not a staple right you the the, the it has anything basically anything that comes in a package probably did not exist 120 years ago so that's probably doesn't, it's not in the category of, of real food. Right, right. Beautiful, beautiful. I, I think that we, we got to publicize what we just discussed over here because it's just uh, something that would help so many people. It's just so simple. People have been taught that life is complex and people have been taught that the solution to their complex problems is even more complex things. And the answer is life is very simple and the solutions are all very simple. Every simple, everything we talked about over here is a simple solution. And we're talking about turning out the lights. We're talking about turning off the phone. We're talking about sitting for a proper meal, sitting about giving fam, focus on love and, and warmth in the family. And uh, that's so simple. Breathing slower. Breathing slower, yeah. Talking slower. <laughs> you know, now, now we have this thing with, you can listen to WhatsApp messages and, and recordings at two times speed. And like our brain is working at like twice the th twice the speed of, of what even what it's meant to work at. It's like, oh my yeah, gosh. I know. I do that. I do that two times speed. But you know, it it's not it's not the way to go. Right. Right. You know, I was thinking about that because it says in this week's Torah portion, Vaikra, that the spaces were made for Hashem made spaces in his communications with Meshra Beno, Moses, our teacher, in order to be in order to give Moses our teacher the opportunity to process and digest what he had been told. And I'm starting to realize that when I get these messages and I'm like, hey, some people speak very slowly and I want to like speed it up, but there's some people I want to hear what they're saying. And I want to hear the breathing. I want to hear the pauses. 
some people send me messages that are really profound. But, you know, if it's just like, uh, I got a, pro, you know, a simple transactional issue, maybe it can go a little fast. But if I want to hear someone's talking about the, he's sending me a personal message. He's sending me an insight that he had that came to him from the Abishter. God Almighty gave him an insight into the Torah, into the world, into our mission in the world. And he's taking the trouble to record it and send it to me. I'm like, I want to hear this at the real speed because I want to hear the breathing. I want to hear the pauses. I want to really take in what he's delivering to me, what he's gifting me with at the pace that I meant to receive it. And so I started actually slowing down and, and putting them with the, not speeding up messages, especially this type that I'm talking about, because I want my soul to be able to process it. I want my, my, my intellectual faculties and my emotional faculties to be able to digest the, these words of truth that are being shared with me. And, uh, so it, it's really, we can learn it from the Parsha. This is so interesting. Because that's what we're about to learn inside is that the actual breathing is connected with the essence of the soul. If, if you really want to understand what the person is really saying, how it connects to the essence, then it's important to hear the pause and the breathing. And that's when we, not just the words, but the, the those external, most external um, functions of the lungs when we're speaking, because that connects all the way to the essence. That is, that is so, I'm looking forward to learning that inside because I have a, uh, a voice teacher that I went to lessons to uh, for singing lessons. And he's an opera singer, not a Jewish fellow, very, very profound man. And um, he, he trained another a, a relative of mine who's a, a chazan. And he said to me that his teacher, and there's a lot, these people have a lot of wisdom about the fat, the brain, the brain, the breathing, the body, the posture, I mean, but real wisdom, like a, 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 a Havana, an understanding of the creation of our bodies and the spiritual, the, the spirituality of it. And he said his teacher told, so the first thing you have to learn in, in singing is the breathing, how to take a breath. And no more gulping for breathing breath. He says, his teacher taught him, you need to take every breath like you have something very important to say. Now think about that. Every breath. Not just when I'm about to say the most important statement in certain conversations. No. Every breath I'm breathing in order to, if I'm going to utter it, it, better, it, it has to be an important statement. So it goes right to your point about learning that the breathing, the pausing, there's no rush. And so you learn that the most important thing is taking the breath. If you're singing, the most important thing is the breathing. It's okay to skip a few beats and start the next stanza late if you need to be able to breathe or let the other people sing until I get to take the breath that I want to take to be able to be ready for the next stanza. I don't have to keep up with everyone else. It's a completely different limit, a completely different way of, of understanding. Well, let's let's do this part of Yehud Hashem. If, if God is speaking and he's creating the world, but we want to connect to Yehud Law, the higher oneness, and the, the benefit of the higher oneness is that that the, the clippers become nullified. There's no battle. So we can look at the pacing that God is giving. Just stop for a second and watch the pacing of nature. Watch the pacing even of a city. Just watch the pacing because that pacing is going to connect us, not the objects, but the pacing is going to connect us to the Yichudei Law, to the, the, the higher oneness, because that connects all the way that's being expressed from the essence of God. So we need to pay attention to that because naturally we don't necessarily pay, pay, pay attention to the pacing of the day. Look outside, look at the pacing of the day. What do you notice? Because that is deeper than the words themselves. The words are the objects of the world. Do you see anything different today from yesterday or the day or the day before? That that that's a message. Now let's, I guess we should now read it inside. 
Thank you. I have nothing to say. That's so profound. It's it only it merits total silence. <laughs>